Again and again we must remember and remind ourselves all the time that when true knowledge dawns, there is no need for words. These are the words of none other than Jalaluddin Rumi. And on another occasion Rumi has said, All that escapes your tongue is expenses. All that enters your ears is income. A wise man always makes sure that the income is more than his expenses. So now you realize that you're talking to a bloody idiot. <laughs> <laughs> it is very easy to say that we are a we are from your formulated Baba, whom we are accepted as God in human form, but we really do not understand him. Even great masters do not know him. One day Junaid was in a very introspective mood, and uh, Junaid was saying to himself, there are millions and millions of human beings all over the world. How come he has selected me for his infinite blessings of total peace of mind and the bliss that I enjoy all the time? Is it because there is an act of injustice committed even in his court? And Junid himself answered the question by saying, that cannot be. He is the only one in the whole of the universe. Against whom can he act unjustly? Then could it be an act of favoritism on his part? And the answer was the same. That cannot be. He is the only one. Again and again. <laughs> the right time. Again, the, my beloved is perfect. <laughs> he is the only one. As such, with whom could... Sit down, ma, you eat, sit down, mummy. Uh, uh, you can edit all this rubbish afterwards, yeah. With whom could he act with favoritism, since he is the only one? Then he himself answers the question by saying that uh, the only reason for this is the basic nature of our beloved. Infinite love, infinite compassion, infinite mercy. It is because of that that I am the recipient of this grace, this peace of mind, this uh, inner bliss that I enjoy. Like that. Because trying to understand God with our finite minds would be the height of stupidity on my part. He is infinite. But once in a while we know, we know from the incidences that occur in his life that what this, this infinitude really is. One of the most beautiful stories that touched my heart was that of Prophet Muhammad. <clears throat> Muhammad had departed the world. But one day he called Jibreel to him. And he says to Jibreel, Jibreel, I want you to go, to go down into the world and find out who are the lovers of God. And Jibreel said, Muhammad, what's wrong with you? All those who obey your orders, all those who offer prayers five times a day, all those who observe fast in the month of Ramazan, such are the people who love God. He said, consider to be an act of a senile old man. Go and find out who are the real lovers of God. And Jibreel said, how should I do it? Tomorrow morning, take the form of a dance idiot and carry this, carry this sewing needle in your hand and go to all the people, you know, learned people, philosophers, this, that and what not and ask them this very simple question, can a camel pass through the eye of the needle and see what response they give you. So the next morning, and he gave him a time, like beloved Baba, by five or six in the evening, be back and report to me. So Jibril went. And he approached the philosophers and the mullahs and the monks and the priests and the fire temple allahs and all. They all would look at that idiot. He had taken that form of an idiot. And he said, get out you bloody idiot. How can a camel pass through an eye of a needle? Don't waste our time. Nearly the whole day had passed off. And then he's returning. On the way, he passed by a pub. And there, a man, a young man had sozzled himself completely, so much drunk that he had fallen in the gutters and all the dirty water was flowing all over him. Out of anger and contempt for that man, Jibril approached him and he shook him and he said, Hey, get up. And he said, yeah, what do you want? What do you want? And he says, I want to ask you a question. Yeah? He said, can a camel pass through the eye of this needle? And this man... 
Give me your needle. Give me your needle. He took the needle in his hand, looked at it for a wee while, and he said to Jibreel, "Go and tell your go and tell your friend, the one who sent you, that if he show so wishes, let alone a camel, the whole universe will pass through the eye of the needle." And then Jibreel realized who are the lovers of God. Mm-hmm. That is when when he returned back to Muhammad, it Muhammad told Jibreel, "Now you realize." Supposing this man lying in the gutter had cried out, La ilaha illallah, Muhammad al-Rasulallah, there is no God except Allah, and Muhammad is his prophet. Do you think that infinite truth would have been any the less truth because by whom it is spoken or where it is spoken? No, Muhammad, it would be the same. That's when Muhammad told him that truth always remains the truth. It requires no support from anyone else. That is the truth. And the truth is that truth. As Francis Brabazon in one of his, no, in his very art he has said, "Creator, yet create creation less you are, you are." Uh, truth, 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 body. Uh, truth, truth in, and truth body. Yeah, you are uh, truth and and truth's body, and that is God. <clears throat> when he comes amongst our meats, he lives in a very you know natural way. There is nothing outstanding about him. He never dresses himself in robes. Studied with diamonds and emeralds, he doesn't wear a crown nor a staff. Nothing. He behaves like an ordinary human being. Very naturalness is the problem that we have to face. And again and again we ask the same question: Is he what he claims himself to be? Because we try and judge him with from our standards, not knowing that God does not require any fanfare. But there are some of the beautiful stories that show his infiniteness. Let us go back to the time when our beloved was in new life, and in new life, beloved Baba had given orders to Eric, everyone rather, that turn by turn they should go and beg for food. That particular day, it was the turn of Eric to beg for food. So Eric goes to the village, and a very poor woman. She herself is so very poor; she has nothing, and she tells Eric, "Please wait." She goes once to the neighbor's house. Begs for a little flour, maize flour, and prepares piping hot chapatis and a little bit of chutney, hot chutney, and gives it to Eric. And Eric told this to beloved Baba, and Baba said, "These are the lovers of mine, Eric." Anyway, Baba distributed the food, and they sat under the shade of a tree, and they were eating. It so happened there were monkeys on top of the tree, and they were chattering. Gani, with the liberty that Baba had granted him. Made a remark. What are these monkeys chattering about? And Gani or Eric made the remark that uh, they are saying to themselves, "What sort of people are these that they are eating food with you, and we would not like to eat?" Beloved Baba acted as if he had not heard anything at all. He kept quiet. The whole incident was forgotten. New life is over. Beloved Baba has come back to his old life and come back to Miraza. And on one occasion, his health was not good. So, whenever Baba's health would not be good, there was a bed kept in that room. I think the location of the bed was where today the chair with the long handle is provided to carry Baba. That was where the bed would be, and beloved Baba would sleep on the bed, facing the wall, and Eric would take uh, yarn lit talcum powder and gently massage his back. Some or other beloved Baba liked the yarn lit products. So. Eric is gently massaging his back. Then beloved Baba started. I know Eric. All your life with me, you people have had to suffer very hard, great hardships. For breakfast, you would have the, the chapatis. I would give you in the night. You would preserve them, and in the morning, I would give you tea without milk or sugar, and you would eat that chapati as as a breakfast. You know, it's very hard life. I know that, but time a time will come. When people will offer you fistful of gold and beg for two slices of bread, no one will give it to them. It is at that time that you all will be having parties after parties, parties after parties, and that time has already come. Way back in time, it has already come. Today it will be Joel's birthday or Bill's birthday. You send them a lunch. He sends them dinner. I give them an ice cream party. Roshan gives them some. Some any you know Hassan gives them some party like that. 
till so many times with this very years i heard my beloved babas near and dear was making a complaint we are fed up with this bloody parties we would much rather like to have spain simple food and i would think to myself and say he never came to give you parties it was only his way of expressing it he never came he let us all the time wondering what the hell is beloved baba hinting at he kept quiet then baba drew his attention to that day in the new life and said eraj remember that day when gani met the remark what are these elf monkeys chattering about and you said they are saying to themselves what sort of uh, human being are these that they are eating food which even we would not like to eat that was not the monk what the monkey said the monkey said how fortunate they are that they today they are sharing the food with the lord of the universe and then he let remember that day and this is god I do not remember the year but on one occasion a governor from south india sent a letter to beloved baba saying i have heard a lot about you and i would like to have your darshan so when the letter was read out to beloved baba beloved baba was not very happy about it and he said to eraj tell him no and eraj said baba he is a governor of some state your know, politeness and decency demands that you grant him an interview so baba said right to the, this governor that on such and such a day from 9 in the morning to 5 after 9 beloved baba has granted you audience you can come and have his darshan then and his pa replied back that on the appointed day the governor will be present now because a, 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 a state governor is visiting from another state some state in south india proper police arrangements were made right up to the very entrance to merazar where the pill box is where the night watchman stand uh, was the senior inspector of police who was in charge of all the security arrangement and uh, baba came early that morning to the mandli hall sat down and told alaba go and save the car of that governor is visible he said no then baba told alaba go and tell that senior officer i don't remember his name call him to me he came <coughs> and baba asked him any sign of the governor approaching he said no baba as soon as you see the car approaching come and let me know he said yes baba 5 minutes later he would send all of back in call that officer <laughs> did, did you see the car coming no baba no as soon as you see the car come and report to me immediately and this went on um teen number of times till it was 11 o'clock in the morning now no one knows what is the 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 hidden play that is going on between the lover and the beloved now 11 o'clock when the inspector came baba told him the governor is not coming all this was arranged for you and when baba said that that inspector burst out crying like a child no one understood what is going on and then baba called him inside embraced him and then he said 11 o'clock time for my near and dear ones to have lunch sit down and have lunch with them the governor was very very happy so when he sat down to lunch with the companions he explained what had happened he said for the last 5 to 7 years i have been eagerly trying to have mer baba's darshan <laughs> every time i would be informed he is out of nagar or if he is in nagar he is in seclusion if he is not in nagar he is gone some place for must tour or this tour for 7 years i could not meet my beloved and today every 5 10 minutes he would call me and give me darshan <laughs> in the end he embraced me and today he has given me the privilege and the permission to sit down and eat food with you such dignified people that is the reason why i burst out crying mm-hmm. then the people understood that all this tamasha was arranged by beloved baba for that one man who craved his audience again a few days later the letter came from the governor that because of such and such a thing he could not give the appointment kindly grant him another interview again in irach in, intervened and said baba okay 9 to 5 after 9 on such and such a day again the whole bloody rick morolo was arranged <laughs> and uh, that time he came 
But before he came, Baba came early into the Mandi hall and told Eretz to hang the chart of uh, creation, will it? Mm-hmm. Yeah, 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 I uh, think so. It's in the God's picks. Mm-hmm. Yes. The, the whole the purpose of creation, whatever. Mm-hmm. Baba told Eretz, hang that chart on the wall opposite mm-hmm. to me. And Eretz said, Baba, in five minutes time you could hardly begin with it, let alone explain the depth of the chart. You just hang the chart over there and <laughs> leave the rest to me. So the chart was hung over there and this governor came and, you know, typically politician attitude. <laughs> and then his glance fell on that chart. Oh, what a chart! Oh, this is perfect! I've never seen anything like that. I'll make sure that I print millions and I'll make sure that each and every classroom in each and every school in Bapuna, in, in India exhibits this chart. And he kept on yapping like a bloody idiot that he was for five minutes. <laughs> when five minutes were over, Baba slept his and said, your audience is over, go. And he left. Then Baba told Eretz, he was a bloody hypocrite. He did not know that I can play the role of a hypocrite better than him. <laughs> <laughs> so I met his hypocrisy with my infinite hypocrisy. And apparently he had my darshan, but in reality he even didn't bother to look at me and he left. This is how. <laughs> Whenever he comes, he comes for the entire creation. He never comes for only human beings. <coughs> Some place in central India, I do not remember the years and all that. For such details, my brother Mervan would be of great help. Some place, uh, beloved Baba, in the evening they would have their dinner very early. And uh, the few years that I've spent in the ashram with my beloved, normally the dinner would consist of very crisp wheat chapati and raw salad like that. Let me digress a bit. Green chilies were not permitted by beloved Baba. And in Jabalpur Ashram, there were bushes of green chilies. And Erech's sister, Nehru, younger to Mani, she died very young. She had cancer of the pancreas. Uh, She was a brave lady. (laughs) None of the Jasawala, Keravala family dared talk to Baba. But she would talk to him very bravely. Hmm. So she liked the food a little bit hot. Now Baba knew what was wrong in her stomach. And the orders were not only for her, but the whole, whole ashram, not to eat chilies. So she collects her chapatis, her plate full of salad and all, and uh, makes sure that Baba is nowhere around <laughs> and slowly grows to that bush. And just as she is about to pluck one or two chilies, and Meru, look at them, the braveness and the audacity of that lady. Oh, so you have come, huh? This is what he tells God. <laughs> yes, of course I have come. This is my ashram. What the hell are you talking about? <laughs> then he said, what were my orders? And she said, I can't eat this food. I mean, you th- <laughs> I am not a four-legged animal. I like something spicy. No, eat this. And he made her eat it. Like that. Similarly, after the dinner would be over, by twilight, Baba, the ladies would sit around Baba and casual conversation would go on. Nothing spiritual about it. And yet remember, every word that the Lord utters has some meaning. It might be as simple as what was the price of the lemon or a cabbage today. But it has meaning. So, they were chitting, you know, chit-chatting very happily when suddenly a ge- gecko, that, that wall lizard, Naja, one of beloved Baba's very close manly, remembers her because remembers that gecko because it was one of the biggest she had ever seen, more than 12 inches long from the tip of its mouth to the end of the tail. And that gecko, chick, 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 it went up to the ceiling, right up to beloved Baba's head and dropped a, lo- a bit of shit on Baba's head. Now, beloved Baba had one habit that there would be a small tip or a table like with a stack of handkerchiefs kept on it. And some or other beloved Baba would use that handkerchief only once and then discard it. 
And many times the purpose of such a huge stack of handkerchiefs was that he was pleased with someone, he would offer it to that individual as a token of love from him. So he picked up that handkerchief and cleaned himself and just discarded it. And conversation flowed very easily. Next evening again, that same thing, again because of the size, Naja remembered it. Chik, 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 it went up and again dropped on beloved Baba's head. Beloved Baba picked up the handkerchief and cleaned the head and discarded the hanky. Third night it happened and now Naja decided it is high time I kill this bloody thing. So the next night she comes with a long broom which could reach the ceiling and put it by her chair. And we'll now look at the fun of it. Beloved Baba does not uh, notice such a big broom lying next to the Naja's chair. Conversation is flowing and chick, 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 it went up. As soon as it went up, Naja grabbed the broom and charged. And Beloved Baba, as if he had not observed anything, looked very surprised. Hey, what's going on? Has she gone mad? What is it? What are you doing, Naja? What are you doing? No, Baba, for the last three nights, this bloody thing is shitting on your head. I'm going to kill it. Why? So what? I pick up a handkerchief, I kill, clean myself, and I throw it away. Why are you so upset about all that? Why do you want to kill it? It has not harmed any one of us. Why do you want to do it? No, Baba, I don't. No. Then he made a, put the broom down, made a sit down. And then again his sense of humor came up. And he smiled and turned to all the ladies sitting there and said, This gecko is less pain in my neck than you all sitting here. <laughs> <laughs> And remember, he's talking not about people like us. He's talking about his very intimate and near ones, who I'm sure might have included even Mera. This is how Lord behaves, I think. That is one of the stories of the animals that I love. And the one that really surpasses in beauty is beloved Baba mentioning to the Mandi in Mera right, one day, and fed up with this universal work. Let us go. We'll enjoy a circus today. And there is a small place near to Ahmadnagar called Chas, I think, a village, very close by. And Baba said, we'll go and visit that circus. And everyone said, yes, Baba, come on. As I just remarked, he never comes to visit circus or see Laurel and Hardy. No. Whatever he does has the ultimate purpose of his work in creation. Anyway, they all left. Now, reverting back to the circus, when a circus is uh, put up in a, a small village and the owner of the circus wants to perform, there's only one way he could do it, by tickling the ego of the village head. And how to do that? So, the very first ring, the chair is reserved for the village head. And then the elephant is taught that he should carry a garland and when the show begins, he would drape it around the neck of the village head. And the whole audience would know, oh, he is the village head. <laughs> Like that. On that particular day, beloved Baba comes with his near and dear ones and occupies the front seat. The elephant had been taught umpteen number of times which particular chair the elephant should approach and to whom the garland should be offered. But the elephant had more sense than the owner of the circus. <laughs> he entered the ring, the drums are beating, and he went straight to the chair where the Lord was sitting. And he put the garland round his neck. And you know the audience, who is he, who is he? Nair Baba has come from Ahmad Mecca. And the whole audience stood up, typical of India. They all stood up to bow down to beloved Baba. Baba acknowledged the salutations. But once that was done, finished, his work got interrupted. He said, my work is done, let us go. And he left. Mm. What I'm trying to convey is that an elephant realized who he is. But sometimes we human beings fail to realize who he is. And the monkeys. So, and and the the monkey, monkeys. monkey, monkey, everyone, yes. <laughs> well, it was a time when you came back from sea, right? And uh -huh. you recognized who uh -huh. he was, right? Uh -huh. When you were in Mondali Hall. Uh -huh. And he said, Some, you know who I am? <laughs> <laughs> that was again the way he would pull one's legs. That was in Satara, 1954. Uh -huh. I'm sitting down at his feet, you know, head bowed down like this. Uh, because I was always afraid to look at him. Because I knew in my heart of heart that I'm in the presence of one individual who knows me thoroughly well, knows thoroughly well, well that what utter shit I am. So in order to draw my attention, he would snap his fingers like that. 
And I looked up and he says, do you know me, Sam? I said, of course, Baba, I know you. <laughs> and then he says to the great dignitary sitting there, Pendu, Eraj, Nilu, Vishnu, Kaka. Kustachi, Kaka. Yeah, that. See, you all have spent 30 and 40 years at my feet and you do not know me. Sam has come two days before me, before from Pune, and he knows me very well. <laughs> I said, not like that. No. <laughs> and mind you, Gustavji was no mean man. From his very childhood and young age, he wanted to be in search of a master. And uh, in those days, early, early 1900, Sai Baba had become very famous nearly all over India, but mostly in Maharashtra. So he went to Sai Baba of Shirdi. And Sai, Sai Baba said, okay, stay here. And after that, Sai Baba totally ignored him, completely ignored him. He, otherwise, Sai Baba would make sure that each and everyone visiting the ashram had proper lunch and food and all that. But with Gustavji, nothing thing. A stage came when he would literally pluck grass and weeds from the, you know, field, boil them and drink that as a soup. He became so fed up that he said to himself, no, this is not for me. I think my relations with Sai Baba are now over. Tomorrow I will leave. And just for that very particular purpose, he had kept in his bag a sum of 50 rupees for his return journey to Bombay. 25 or 50, I don't know, I'm not sure for the amount. Now Sai Baba knew <laughs> what is going on. So that particular evening, when the darbar opened, Sai Baba says, you know, honestly, I'm not <laughs> joking. I'm very serious today. I need 50 rupees very urgently. Please give it to me. I'll return it back tenfold times. Just give it to me. I need it very badly. And <laughs> Gustachi, as if he has not heard anything. Again, Saima <laughs> repeated the same thing. I need it very badly. I'm not joking. I promise you. I promise you I'll return it back ten to hundred times over. Please give it to me now. <laughs> Third time Sai Baba said it and Gustavji just kept quiet. And Sai Baba, you know, with his fiery temple, jumped up, went to Gustavji, caught his collar. Fifty rupees are in your trunk and you didn't open your bloody mouth? Do you think what I'm, I'm saying is just <laughs> out of fun or something? Huh? Then Gustavji also lost his temper. I've been in your ashram for three months. You did not even offer me proper food. I had to pluck grass and boil it and drink it as soup. And you want me to stay with you? Then <laughs> Sai Baba gave orders, as of tomorrow, make sure that he gets his proper food. And then I think he was given a very strange duty. A log of food had to be carried from one corner, then again brought over from that corner, put over here. And after that uh, discipline was over, Sai Baba told him, now your turn is with Mir Baba. Go to him. You have nothing to do with me. That is how Gustaji came. He passed through, through the hands of two great masters. Yes. I think in between he went to Upasli Maharaj. Yes. yes. Uh, he went to Upasli Maharaj also. And Upasli Maharaj then sent him to Mayor Baba. These are the ways of very mysterious ways of thought. Strange, strange things happen around him. Uh, another beautiful incident that took place was narrated to us by our beloved Baba's sister Mani. In the early years, when the ashram began, there were nearly about 30, 39 ladies there. And they were all novices to God and the, His ways of working. And there was always this, you know, that sort of a race going on. Who advances further? <laughs> because everyone had a, a thought at the back of the mind that one who advances on the, spa, on the path acquires spiritual powers and that was the tempting sweet they were after. Baba was fully aware of all that. So one day he told Mani, Mani, today I'll call everybody. Four o'clock in the evening would be everybody in that uh, pandal. Not in a pandal. No. Opposite to Mansari's shed. Not Baba's Gadi. 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 And, mm, and uh, everybody meant literally everybody. And few occasions when I, 
my mummy and I, we were there at Mehrabad during my school holidays. We would all be present there. But as young children, we never paid much attention to him. So, Baba told Mani that today I will declare that I have given Mani certain powers. Ask her any questions and she will answer them. And Baba gave her a few signs. If I make this sign, that will be the question and you give this answer. And accordingly, Baba made the declaration and questions were put to Mani. And Mani would keep looking at Baba and Baba would make the particular sign and but she would give the reply. And everyone felt, oh, Baba has given Mani spiritual powers. <laughs> <laughs> After three, four days, Baba then declared this was all a joke. I taught money what answers to give and all. Then years and years passed by, and on 31st of January 1969, beloved Baba dropped his body. And uh, after seven days, they all returned back to Merazad. And there was nothing left now except the beautiful memories of the years that had gone by. And Suddenly, Mani remembered that day when Baba had played that trick with other ladies. And she realized that the surprising part of it was not that Baba knew the questions, uh, knew, 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 the, knew, the knew, knew the answers, because they knew what the questions were to be. As a matter of fact, I, I in my heart of heart, I felt not only did he know the questions, but he, he, he was the one who prompted the question. He is the only one. And that's why money could answer them very beautifully. Similarly, somewhere in Hamirpur or some place, beloved Baba had gone for darshan. And a huge gathering had taken place. And there were many people who wanted to ask beloved Baba personal questions. About 12.30 or so, Baba said, I'm tired, I'm retiring for a few, more, an hour or two. And then uh, I'll commence my darshan program again. In the meantime, if anyone has any personal questions, you write it down and give it to Pukar. And Pukar will give it to me and then I will answer the questions, each individual question. Accordingly, people wrote down the questions and gave it to Pukar. And in no, no time, his cloth bag was full of questions. Frightened, he came running to Baba in his room and said, Baba, the whole bag is full of questions. I don't think there will be time enough for you to answer all of that. Should we stop accepting questions? Carry on, accept them, don't worry. So the questions came on and on and on. And after a wee while, it stopped. And then, something very strange happened. Sam would go to Pukar and say, Mr. Pukar, I got the answer to my question in my heart. Kindly give me my question back. Little while later, Hassan would go, Pukar, mere ko to, I got the answer. Please give me my question back. Like that then, the, uh, the rush was the other way around, everyone claiming that question back. And in no time the whole bag was over. Then Baba came out and everything. End of the Darshan program, Baba called Pukar to him. And he said to him, Pukar, if I had been an ordinary human being, you collecting all these questions would have no meaning because I couldn't answer them. But you know who I am. You know the reality that I am. I am the nearest to that heart. So it, it was very simple for me to answer that question directly in the heart. You had nothing to worry about. And then Pukar realized that he was dealing with none other but God in human form. actually was a revolutionary. Oh, he was actually a revolutionary who had come to kill Baba hmm? in the Hamirpur Mela. Yes. yes. Hmm. Hmm? And yeah. Baba was staying in a dharamshala, the veranda of which opened to the river bank. And Pukar was standing on the other side of the bank with a revolver ready, everything ready to shoot the man. And uh, Baba knew what was happening. So he comes out on the veranda with his four companions. And Pukar was also with uh, three or four of his other revolutionary friends who had all planned to kill Baba on that day. And suddenly, to the utter surprise of Pukar's friends, Pukar gave a loud scream and fainted and fell down and fainted. And they didn't understand what was going on. And then, as, as soon as that happened, Baba went into the room. Then Pukar came back to you know, revive himself. They asked, hey, what is wrong with you? Why did you faint and scream and all that? 
He said, what the hell, man? When Mir Baba came on that veranda, I didn't say Mir Baba. I saw Ram no. standing there with his bow and arrow. Exactly. It was Ram himself standing there. And similar thing happened in Satana. Baba <laughs> was in seclusion. And Baba told Eraj, don't disturb me in the afternoon today. Knowing full well what is to happen, he told Eraj, no one should come, no one, don't disturb me at all, I'm in my seclusion. Yes, Baba. About 1.30 or so, a sadhu came along and backed up Eraj. I will not disturb Mir Baba. I will just peep through the window and then walk away. He <laughs> said, no. Baba is in seclusion and he has given me orders. No, I'm sorry. I promise you, I swear I will not come create any commotion. I'll just peep, look at Mir Baba and walk away. Eraj's heart was melted. He says, promise. Yes. <laughs> so Eraj took him to the window of beloved Baba's bedroom. That man peeped inside. And suddenly he gave such a loud scream and fainted. Eraj was so furious, he said, I would not make any commotion and look at the bloody shit. What has he done? He has, he has put me into trouble. And Baba jumped up from the bed. What happened? I told him not to do anything. And Eraj said, Baba, I'm sorry this man said, I will not disturb you. <laughs> you can't do it. Very quiet about it. Then Baba said, call him inside. Call him. And Baba said, why did you scream? Actually, this was done to clarify the point for Eric. He mm -hmm. said, why did you scream? Huh? You could have peeped at me from the window and then walked away. He says, how could I do that? I see you standing with your bow and there is a Sita next thing, <laughs> standing next to you. I got the <laughs> direction of Ram. I got frightened, I screamed and fainted. Then Eric realized what had happened. That owner had a uh, theater or some room kept for only them. I think they know her. her. And he had not allowed anybody. This was this happened in Madras. Beloved Baba had gone to Madras for mass darshan program and uh, a certain Madrasi came over for Baba's darshan. The reason Eraj remembered him was that this mad average Madrasi are, are a short stretched. It is recently I am noticing that even in India our youngsters are now, you know, becoming Shooting tall up. and all that. Yeah. You know. so the whole, whole, whole of evolution seems to be changing. Yeah. Otherwise, uh, an average height of the Indian was something like five three five 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 six. Now it is six six two six three like that. Anyway, so Eraj remembered this madrasi because of his height. He bowed down to Baba and left. And then, uh, after the darshan program was over, Baba said, "Come on, let's go for a drive in Madras." So they went, and Baba took over the directions. Eraj go this way, that way. Till at last they came to a movie house and Baba said, stop the car here. And Baba opened the door and went in. And the Baba's three companions also followed. Baba en entered the movie house and there were steps leading to the second floor. Baba went up the steps and the, uh, his companions followed him. The owner of that uh, theater was standing in the corner. He observed all this going on. And he, he was surprised, what's going on here? No one even bothers to ask me what is going on. So he followed. In the meantime, beloved Baba had opened that one room that was there on the second floor, opened the door, and there was nothing there except a picture of Ram on the wall and an empty chair. There was no furniture, nothing at all. And Baba sat down in that chair. This man came up running and he saw beloved Baba sitting in that chair. And uh, he fell at his feet and began to cry like a child. And Baba embraced him, pacified him and all. <coughs> The Mandli did not understand what was going on. Then, after everything was over, he explained that from my very childhood, I had a great desire to have the darshan of Ram. But in India, self-proclaimed God men are a dime a dozen. So I, don't know, I did not know who was the real one. So I decided this is my test for the real God man. When I constructed this uh, cinema house, I constructed this room with this picture of Ram and an empty chair 
and in my heart of heart I said, one, without any knowledge of all this, comes and occupies this chair, is the real Lord Ram for me. My family also does not know why this room has been created. Today, this man, I had this darshan in the morning, and in the evening he comes and occupies this chair. Is my Lord Ram come again? That is how the Lord Ram Again, you, we hear this wow and all. But the reality is that when it, it doesn't happen like that, that's when we must say, wow, what, what's wrong? <laughs> that is when we have to say that, not now. But there are certain requirements from us also. And what are the requirements? Complete love and surrenderance to Him. And that reminds me of a very beautiful occasion where Bahuddin Nakshaband, according to the Sufis, there are four major Sufi orders. The Nakshabandi order, the Kadiriyani order, the Chishtiyani order and the Shuravardi order. So Shuravardi was very ruthlessly killed by the fanatic Muslims. So also Mansur Hallaj. Bahuddin Nakshaband was asked by his disciples what should be the attitude and approach of the lovers of God. And Bahuddin said, I'll answer your question sometime later. Okay. Few days later, Bahuddin said, come on, let us go for a stroll in the evening. It is nice and pleasant. We'll go to the river bank. And they all went along with the master. And standing by the river bank, Bahuddin addresses the river. And he says to the river, oh river, innumerable are the blessings that you have showered on God's creation. Your waters supply us with drinking water. Your waters give us agriculture. The flowing energy of your water gives us uh, uh, industry and en energy and all that. Innumerable are the blessings, so much so that I do not have enough words how to thank you. The disciples are all hearing all this. And now it is Bahuddin himself speaking, but as if the river is answering. And the river says to Bahuddin, remember it is Bahuddin speaking. And the river says, Bahuddin, I do not know what the hell you are talking about. I never knew that I was such a great blessing to God's creation. I never knew that I give drinking water to His creation. I never knew that it is my water that provides you with agriculture. My flow of water, the energy that is provided, gives you industries and all. I know nothing of that. All I know is that I flow swiftly and fast so that I can reach the ocean, merge in the ocean, and become one with him. That is my only purpose. Then he turned to his disciples and said, this should be the attitude and approach of lovers of God. The beautiful way they teach us all. <coughs> Many a times we feel that we are rendering service, but uh, there might be some selfish motive attached to that. And uh, this is the story of one Egyptian master by the name of Zu al -Nun. He was a fisherman and a very, very, very rich Egyptian young man had fallen in love with the master and he came and began to serve the master. And the duty given by the master, Zu al -Nun, was that he should run the expenses of the ashram. So naturally being a very, very wealthy man, he would provide money for all the financial needs of the ashram. But the only problem was that Zhu or Nun would never even look at him. Now, let alone say thank you, not even bother to look at him. And that always hurt that young Egyptian. But he kept quiet. The thing is that the Egyptian wanted the attention of the master. Till one fine day, all his money was over. And that night, going to bed, he says to himself, from tomorrow I'll see how this bloody ashram is being run. And that night, Zhu al -Nun called him to his room and said, Karan, sit down here. Sit down. And then Zhu al -Nun said, you see that uh, you, you, a huge heap of white clay. In Egypt, by the banks of the river, they have white clay. And they make pots and pens out of that. And I had once brought it also. If you fill water in it, it becomes so nice and chilled like ice water in the summer months. It's a very beautiful, uh, some, some very strange characteristic of that clay, whatever it be. A huge hip was lying in the corner and uh, Zuvalnun told that Egyptian, get me a fistful of clay. 
And then he began to chit chat with that young man and playing with the, uh, that lump. In no time it turned into a, a, a precious ruby, the size of a duck's egg, very big ruby. And Zhu Alun told him, tomorrow you go to the jewelers and find out the value of this ruby. Don't sell it. Just find out the value of the ruby and then come to me and report. He says, okay. He went to the market and went to the jewelers and the price quoted was exactly the amount that he had spent all these years for the ashram. And he came back. And Zuval Nun said, did you find out the value? He said, yes. How much was it? This much amount. How much did you spend for the ashram, running of the ashram? So must have the same amount. And then Zuval Nun gave the orders, go, pick up that stone and smash that ruby into pieces. And when he came back, he said, you bloody fool. Do you realize that if even once I had said thank you to you, you would have had your reward in this world only? I did not want to, you to have that. I wanted that your reward should be in the world to come. That's why I never said thank you. I neglected you. If once even I had said thank you, all your efforts would have been washed away. There would have been nothing left for you. But I wanted that you should have your reward in the real world to come. And that is why I never said it. So, then he realized. And then Zohar Nun told him, now from tomorrow, serve the ashram in the right manner. And he said, Master, I am a pauper. I'll take care of that. And next morning news came back that overnight he had become more than double the richer, rich man that he was before. And then he began to serve his Lord in the right manner. <laughs> again and again our shortcomings and he forgives them. A certain individual went on top of a mountain and uh, <clears throat> prayed to Allah and said, Allah, all I want is one chapati a day. So if you could kindly provide me that, then I will, you know, devote all my time to your love and remembrance. And a divine voice was said, okay, from tomorrow, a, 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 a pea loaf of bread would be put at the doorstep of your heart. And you can eat half in the morning and half in the evening. And he was very happy. Nineteen years the routine was absolutely maintained. And one day the loaf, was, loaf of bread was not there. Huh. And the Lord had given him orders, as of now, don't ever go down the mountain to the village to beg for food. You are not to beg from anyone except me. Nineteen years the routine went on very smoothly, only one day the bread was not there. He forgot the order and he came down the mountain to beg at the village doors. And he came to a house of a rich man and a dog was lying there. Now this dog was no ordinary dog. He was Kizer, the invisible guide. So the master was feeding that dog and he gave him one loaf and the dog ate it up. And the dog looked at the master and the master realized that he is still hungry. So he gave him another loaf, he ate that also. Again the dog looked at the master and he was still hungry, so the master gave him third loaf. And this man, standing and watching all this, says in his heart of heart, how ungrateful is this bloody creature. Master gave him three loaves and yet he is not satisfied. How ungrateful is he? But he was Kizer, and then now the dog begins to speak. And he says, you bloody fool, you shitbag, you called me ungrateful. Hmm? Nineteen years God provided you with a loaf of bread which you were eating morning and evening. Only one day He did not give it to you. Like a bloody beggar you came running down the mountain and begged for food from the villages, breaking the orders of Allah not to do so. Now tell me who is ungrateful, you or me? <laughs> Whenever my master takes me for you know hunting or anything, there are days on end when he does not give me anything. There are days on end then when I am surviving only on water. But all this time I would never leave the footsteps and the hills of my master. Just one day God did not provide you with a loaf of bread. You left that mountain to beg from human beings. Where was your promise to God that you will not do so? And the man began to cry. And he said, forgive me. And Kiza said, I'm sorry. Nineteen years of your prayers and repentance have been washed away by that one act of negligence. Amen. This is no joke. The path is not meant for any...
of the likes of us. As a poet has said, you offered me a cup of poison and then told me to drink it and die. Obeying your orders, I drank that cup of poison. Then you turn around and tell me, now you will have to leave. <laughs> and this is God. I think I have enough. I think. Again and again, let us enter our prayer with my favorite prayer of mine. I always say to myself in my heart of heart, to all the great masters that have been, that are, and that are yet to come, and above all to that divine beloved of mine, of whom it has been said, to khud be khud azad budi, to khud giraftar amadi. On your own you became eternally free, and yet for the likes of me you bound yourself again and again, again and again, to free me from my own ignorance. To that eternal beloved of mine, my millionfold salutations at his lotus feet. Jai Baba. Jai Baba. Chala Roshan of Chai Banadiya. Tea? Now tea time. Tea time. My tongue is dry. <laughs> <laughs> I hate tea. Now you can edit it. You, all, it. you all would like to have with milk and uh, sugar. Uh, 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 what about you? Uh, Just Tea, tea. Yeah, tea is fine. Uh, but uh, with tea. milk and sugar? Okay. Milk and sugar, okay. Normal tea. Milk and sugar. Yeah. Okay. Do you have abnormal tea? Abnormal tea? No, tea.